The Will of Man. I want to do a study on this subject because I kind of think um, we're in a time today when really the will of man is degrading very quickly. I mean, like it's almost dead. All right. And what I mean by that is when, when we have certain crises going on uh, seemingly against the Christian, it seems like my Christian brethren almost want to throw in the towel. <laughs> and, you know, and they'll say, uh, well, you know, it's the end times and this is just God's will and, you know, there's nothing we can do about that to change that, so therefore we're not going to stand up and fight. And I don't really agree with that at all. I think the Father, even if we are in the end times, his plan allows for, allows and factors in our actions to fight on his behalf and fight the adversary. I want to go through a couple examples of what really a soldier of the Lord should be. I want to start out first with a prayer. Heavenly Father, I want to thank you, Father, for this word. We thank you for your whole plan of salvation through your Son and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Father, we ask that you would bless all who listen with wisdom and discernment and understanding of your word. Let your word and your truth be revealed here today, not from my spirit, but only from the Holy Spirit. And uh, we'll be sure and give you the praise for it. In the name of your Son and our Savior, Jesus Christ, Yeshua Messiah. Amen. So, I want to go to, um, I'm going to go to Judges chapter 6. And we'll see what's going on here uh, in the land of Israel, right? And it reads in uh, Judges 6, 1, And the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. <laughs> You know, that's usually not a good thing. In fact, it seems like seems like ever since they came out of Egypt, it's like a generation can't go by without them turning away from God, worshiping false gods and idols, and going after strange flesh. I don't know what the deal is with these people that they can't do they do they just not have the ability to actually you know, hand down the commandments of God to the next generation? I don't know. I mean, but they have done it repeatedly over and over and over until the Father said, you know, to heck with it. I'm going to scatter you throughout the world. You're not even going to know who you are. And they don't. But let's take a look at an example here of really the kind of, the kind of army that, God wants. And when I mean that by army, we're not talking about um we're not talking about killing people necessarily. I mean back then maybe we are, but anyone who's going to stand up for the Lord. So I want to go here and we're going to read about Gideon. And uh, I'll pick it up in Judges chapter 6, verse 1. And it reads, And the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord delivered them into the hand of Midian seven years. And the hand of Midian prevailed against Israel, and because of the Midianites, the children of Israel made themselves dens which are in the mountains and caves and strongholds. So basically, they ran away. They ran to the hills and started living in caves. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, they basically just gave up everything they had to the Midians because they were afraid. And so it was when Israel had sown that the Midians came up and the Amalekites and the children of the east, even they came up against them and they encamped against them and destroyed the increase of the earth, killed everything they had, all their crops, probably all their cattle, livestock, till thou come unto Gaza, and left no sustenance for Israel, neither sheep nor ox nor ass. 
for they came up with their cattle and their tents, and they came as grasshoppers for multitude. It's like like locusts upon the earth that just came and devoured everything they had. And you want to know, they let them do it. Not very bold for these people. For both they and their camels were without number, and they entered into the land to destroy it. And Israel was greatly impoverished because of the Midianites, and the children of Israel cried unto the Lord. Oh, yeah, they were in trouble. They cried unto the Lord. They didn't cry unto the Lord when things were good and give them thanks for everything they had. No, they waited till a crisis occurred and then they cried unto the Lord. Like, why should God even listen to them? I want to move ahead here to uh, verse 11. And it reads, And there came an angel of the Lord and sat under an oak, which was an Ophrah. And Ophrah means fawn that pertained unto Joash the Abizrite. Uh, I think it's close to how you say it. Let's look at the uh, the word it comes from here, and we'll see what it says here. Strong's H33. Aviezer. Aviezer. All right, Aviezer. So this is uh, Aviezer right. <laughs> So I don't know if that is correct or not, but a B is right. And his son, Gideon, threshed wheat by the wine press to hide it from the Midianites. So he didn't want them to see the wheat and so forth. They threshed it, and I think what you have then is just the seeds of the of the wheat and so forth that are left. And the angel, and because they had basically come and taken everything from the Israelites, they were going to come and take the wheat as well, Right. So this is his way of, Gideon's a pretty wise man here. It's like, hey, I think I can hide this if I thresh it here and get rid of the, you know, the stalks or whatever they have for wheat, whatever you call them. Um, anyway, that was, that was probably pretty wise. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him. He appeared unto Gideon and said unto him, the Lord is with thee, thou mighty man of valor. And Gideon said unto him, O oh my Lord, if the Lord be with us, then why then is all this befallen us? And where be all his miracles, which our father told us of, saying, Did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now the Lord hath forsaken us and delivered us into the hands of the Midianites. Now they were pretty pretty impoverished, but uh, Gideon, uh, you know he was wise with the wheat and so forth, but he apparently did not catch on that they were actually worshiping Baal (laughs) or false gods or, you know, idols and so forth. They were heavily into idol worship. And the Lord looked upon him and said, Go in this might, oh, sorry, go in this thy might, and thou shalt save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. Have Have not I sent thee? Question mark. And he said unto him, O my Lord, wherewith shall I save Israel? How am I going to save Israel? Behold, my family is poor in Manasseh, and I am the least in my father's house. You know, in other words, he's the poorest. All right. And the Lord said unto him, Surely I will be with thee, and thou shalt smite the Midianites as one man. And he said unto him, If I now have found grace in thy sight, then show me a sign that thou talkest with me. And he wants to know, hey, I want to know if you really are an angel of the Lord. (laughs) So depart not hence, I pray pray thee until I come unto thee and bring forth my present and set it before thee. And he said, I will tarry until thou come. And Gideon went in and made ready a kid. And uh, this would be a, um, uh, maybe a sheep. And uh, uh, of a younger, you know, a, a young sheep. Anyway, an offering. And unleavened cakes of an ephah of flour. The flesh he put in the basket, and he put the broth in a pot, and brought it out to him under the oak, and presented it. And the angel of God said unto him, Take the flesh and the unleavened cakes, and lay them upon this rock, and pour out the broth. And he did so. And the, then the angel of the Lord put forth the end of the staff 
that was in his hand and touched the flesh of the unleavened cakes, and there arose up a fire out of the rock and consumed the flesh and the unleavened cakes. Then the angel of the Lord departed out of his sight. So it's what it basically what Gideon did here is he tested the spirit. He's like, hey, listen, if you are a man of an angel of the Lord, I'm, I want to know this for certain. So he kind of tested the spirit here. So, and when Gideon perceived that he was an angel of the Lord, Gideon said, alas, O Lord God, for because I have seen an angel of the Lord face to face. I mean, that must have been something. And the Lord said unto him, peace be unto thee, fear not, thou shalt not die. Then Gideon built an altar thereupon, or there unto the Lord, and called it Jehovah Shalom. Um, unto this day, it is yet in, in Ophrah of the Eb- Ebrezites, rights. sorry. Um, let's just move on here. I don't want to break that down. You can break that down if you like, in your strongs. And it came to pass in the same night that the Lord said unto him, take thy father's young bullock. He's going to give him a little chore to do here and do it this night. Even the second bullock of seven years and throw down the altar of Baal. You're going to destroy that altar of Baal that thy father hath and cut down the grove that is by it. I mean, his father had this altar, Gideon's father. And build an altar unto the Lord God, Lord thy God, upon the top of this rock in the ordered place. And take the second bullock and offer a burnt sacrifice with the wood of the grove. And now, here the thing is, the grove here is a, is a wooden idol. And if you study it, you would realize this, uh, this wooden idol is um, a phallic. All right. It was a um, idol of perversion. That the and this was Baalism, right? And this was the the whole house of Israel now is worshiping these things, right? Anyway, he wants him to bust that idol down, and he wants it to use use that as the wood for the fire for the sacrifice. So, um, and offer a burnt sacrifice with the wood of the grove, which thou shalt cut down. Then Gideon took ten men of his servants and did as the Lord had said unto him, and it was so, because he feared his father's household and the men of the city that he could not do it by day, that he did it by night. And when the men of the city arose early in the morning, behold, the altar of Baal was cast down, and the grove was cut down that was by it, and the second bullock was offered upon the altar that was built. And they said one to another, who hath done this thing? And when they inquired and asked, they said, Gideon, the son of Joash, hath done this thing. And the men of the city said unto Joash, bring out thy son that he may die, because he hath cast down the altar of Baal, and because he hath cut down the grove that was by it. And Joash said unto all that stood against him, will you plead for Baal? Question. Will you save him? I mean, the idol's already been destroyed. He that will plead for him, let him be put to death whilst it is yet morning, while it's still morning. And if he be a god, if in other words, if Baal is a god, let him plead for himself, because one hath cast down his altar. Therefore on that day he called him Jerubbaal, which I have this here. It is It means let Baal, right here, let Baal contend. Well, obviously, Baal can't contend here because he has already been destroyed. <laughs> you know, so well, he's going to rise up from the ashes or something and uh, and um, save himself. Anyway, he called uh, that day. He called him Jerubbaal, saying, "Let Baal plead against him because he hath thrown thrown down his altar. Let him, com- you know, plead against Gideon." Then all the Midianites and Amalekites and the children of the east were gathered together and went over and pitched in the valley of Jezreel. But the Spirit of the Lord came upon Gideon. Now, here's why I came here, because we are going to see, we're going to find out the kind of men that God 
likes serving him. The kind of men and women that we should be, bold, not passive, not one who's a doormat for for uh, the adversary. I mean, because people, listen, we are Christian, right? And as Christians, we don't give up ground. We take it. He's going to show us how we take it. And we don't take it with a weak spine. Okay, verse 34. But the Spirit of the Lord came upon Gideon, and he blew a trumpet, and Ebiezer was there, was gathered after him. And he sent messengers throughout all Manasseh, who also was gathered after him. And he sent messengers unto Asher and unto Zebulun and unto Naphtali, and they came up to meet them. And Gideon said unto God, If thou wilt save Israel by mine hand, as thou hast said, and he's going to test God. Behold, I will put a fleece of wool in the floor, and if the dew be on the fleece only, you know, like a morning dew, and it be dry upon all the earth beside, then shall I know that thou wilt save Israel by my hand, as thou hast said. And it was so, for he, is, he arose up in, early in the morrow and thrust the fleece together and wringed the dew out of the fleece, a, fu- a bowl full of water. <laughs> but now... Gideon's going to test him a second time, just just in case. This is kind of actually funny. But, and Gideon said unto God, let not thine anger be hot against me. I mean, don't get mad at me for testing you again, but I just really, really want to be sure here. And I will speak but this once. Let me prove, I pray thee, but this once with the fleece. Let it now be dry only upon the fleece, and upon all the ground let there be dew. And God did so that night, for it was dry upon the fleece only, and there was dew on all the ground. So he knew this is this is God, and this is uh, this whole th- everything that God said to him that he would deliver the Midianites into his hand is true, and it's not some false spirit or anything like that. And we need to learn; we need to test the spirits as we as we. Um, Go forth. I mean, anytime we think we're hearing of the Lord, uh, are we testing the spirits? A lot of people hearing from God these days. Problem is, God's saying different things to different people, and a lot of them don't line up. So how many are really testing the spirit? All right, so we're going to move on to the next chapter here real quick and get right down to it here. Chapter 7, verse 1, Then Jerubael, who is Gideon, and all the people that were with him, wrote, uh, so it was it, Gideon was named Jerubael. Let Baal contend with Gideon. And all the people that were with him rose up early and pitched beside the well of Herod, so that the host of the Midianites were on the north side of them by the hill of Moreh in the valley. And the Lord said unto Gideon, The people that are with thee are too many. For too many for me to give the Midianites into their hands. I mean, that sounds kind of funny, right? I mean, you think the more the better, right? But God is doing something here. He wants everyone to know that God is doing this. And this is not Gideon. It's not his army. It's God. So uh, too many for me to give the Midianites into their hands, lest Israel vaunt themselves against me, saying, you know, obviously, this is, we did this, God, you didn't do it. So Israel vaunt themselves against me, saying, my own hand hath saved me. <laughs> so, and obviously, hey, ultimately, they're going to do that anyway within a generation, because it seems like the status quo, Right. Now therefore go to proclaim in the ears of the people, saying, Whoever is fearful and afraid, let him return and depart early from Mount Gilead. And there returned out of the people twenty and two thousand, and there remained ten thousand. So there were thirty two thousand people there ready to go to war. And twenty two thousand of them were fearful and afraid. 
no room for them in battle. And the Lord said unto Gideon, The people are yet too many. Bring them down under the water, and I will try them for thee there. And it shall be that of whom I say unto thee, This shall go with thee. The same shall go with thee. And of whom whomsoever I say unto thee, This shall not go with thee, the same shall not go. All right? So he brought down the people under the water, and the Lord said unto Gideon, Everyone that lappeth the water with his tongue, as a dog lappeth, him shalt thou set by himself. Likewise, everyone that boweth down upon his knees to drink, and the number of them that lapped, putting their hand to their mouth, were three hundred men. But all the rest of the people bowed down upon their knees to drink the water. You know, they they did it more civilized. They weren't they weren't lapping it up like dogs, right? And the Lord said unto Gideon, By the three hundred men that lapped will I save you. I mean, these guys were they, you know, they were probably not so civilized, but they were ready for action. And they knew what it meant to fight. In the and uh by these 300 men that laughed will I save you and deliver the Midianites into thine hand and let all the other people go, every man unto his place. So he sent the other 10,000, 9,700 or whatever, packing, sent them home. So the people took victuals in their hand and their, and their trumpets, and he sent all the rest of Israel, every man unto his tent, and retaineth those 300 men. And the host of Midian was beneath him in the valley. And it came to pass in the same night that the Lord said unto him, Arise, get thee down unto the host, for I have delivered it into thine hand. But if thou fear to go down, go down with Fura, thy servant, down to the host. And thou shalt hear what they say, and after shall thine hands be strengthened to go down unto the host. Then went he down to Fura, with Fura, sorry, then went he down with Fura, his servant, unto the outside of the armed men that were in the host. And the Midianites and the Amalekites and all the children of the east lay along the valley like grasshoppers for a multitude. And, and that was, so they were a pretty high number. And their camels were without number. I mean, you couldn't count them. As the sand by the seaside for multitude. And when Gideon was come, behold, there was a man that told a dream unto his fellow and said, Behold, I dreamed a dream, and lo, a cake of barley bread trembled, a tumbled into the host of Midian and came unto a tent and smote it that it fell and turned it, sorry, and overturned it that the tent lay along. And his fellow and his fellow answered and said, There is nothing else save the sword of Gideon, the son of Joash, a man of Israel, for his hand, for into his hand hath God delivered Midian and all the host. And it was so when Gideon heard the telling of the dream and the interpretation thereof that he worshipped. What did he do? He worshipped. And returned into the host of Israel and said, Arise, for the Lord hath delivered into your hand the host of Midian. And he delivered the 300 men into, into three, sorry, and he divided the 300 men into three companies, and he put a trumpet in every man's hand with empty pitchers and lamps within the pitchers. And he said unto them, Look on me and do likewise, and behold, when I come to the outside of the camp, it shall be that as I do, so shall you do. And when I blow the trumpet, I and all that are, are with me, then blow ye the trumpets also on every side of all the camp, and say the sword of the Lord and of Gideon. So Gideon and 300 men that were with them. So what, what Gideon's done is he divided him into three groups of 100, and they're surrounding this area. Right, so when Gideon does this, then they're gonna they're gonna blow these horns all around, right? So Gideon and the hundred men that were with them came unto the outside of the camp in the the beginning of the middle watch, 
and they had but newly set to watch. So these guys just came on duty. And they blew the trumpets and break the pitchers that were in their hands. And the three companies blew the trumpets and break the pitchers and held the lamps in their hands and the trumpets in their right hands to blow withal. And they cried the sword of the Lord and of Gideon. And they stood every man in his place round about the camp and all the hosts ran and cried and fled. Everyone in Midian. In the 300 blew the trumpets, and the Lord set every man's sword against his fellow, even throughout all the hosts. And the hosts fled to Beth Shittah in Zerath. <laughs> Sorry, I probably butchered that, but so be it. And to the border of Abel, Abel Mehola unto Tabith. And the men of Israel gathered themselves together out of Naphtali and out of Asher and out of Manasseh and pursued after the Midianites. And Gideon sent messengers throughout all Mount Ephraim, saying, Come down against the Midianites and take before them the waters unto Beth Bara in Jordan. Then all the men of Ephraim gathered themselves together and took the waters unto Beth Bara in Jordan. And they took two princes of the Midianites, Oreb and Zeb, and they slew Oreb upon the rock, Oreb. And Zeb they slew at the winepress of Zeb. And pursued Midian. And brought the heads of Oreb and Zeb to Gideon on the other side of Jordan. So the Lord delivered them. So basically, I mean, and clearly, there's only 300 of them. And they are against a multitude that is uncountable. And the reason God did it was so that everyone would know this came from God. It wasn't that the Israelites would come up and say, well, you know, we did this ourselves. Anyway, that's a good example of, of how we fight for the Lord. How we are supposed to, I mean, when you go into battle, I don't care what it is. I'm not necessarily talking military battle. It's just when you go into anything and you and you have to face it head on. I mean, what is the first thing Gideon did? He prayed about it. That's what we all have to do. I want to go to another example here, right? And um, we're going to take a look at David and Goliath. Now. Let me uh, explain something here. David was the youngest of Jesse's children. And uh, all his brothers were, they were all uh, warriors of age, you know, mature to go into battle. Except David, he was the youngest. He was still a child. And um, and so he was a shepherd, but, he, you know, he was not afraid. I mean... Well, we're going to read here that uh, David took out a lion and a bear who went after one of his sheep. So I want to pick it up here. This is a great, great example of how we are supposed to, how we are supposed to be a servant and a, I guess a warrior for the Lord. So we'll pick it up in 17, 1 Samuel 17. Get back over there. And uh, Jesse is his father, right? And he's going to ask David to take some food over to his brothers that are, <laughs> they're, they're pitched on one side of a valley. And you have the Philistines on another side of the valley and a big valley in between them. And the Philistines, first of all, they have invaded their land. The Philistines have. Anyway, and Jesse said unto David his son, Take now for thy brethren an ephah of this parched corn. Now an ephah is, is a measurement of dried uh, grain. And it, it could also be the actual container that holds that measurement, but it's you're going to take a certain amount to the your brethren. And these ten loaves, and run to the camp to thy brethren. And 
carry these ten cheeses unto the captain of their thousand. And look how thy brethren fare and take their pledge. I mean, just open up your eyes and take a good look at them and take their pledge. Now Saul, <clears throat> Saul and they and all the men of Israel were in the valley of Elah fighting with the Philistines. And David rose up in the morning and left the sheep with the keeper and took and went as Jesse had commanded him. And he came to the trench as the host was going forth to, fight, to the fight and shouted for the battle. For Israel and the Philistines had put the battle in array, army against army. So they're lined up ready to get down and dirty, right? And David left his carriage in the hand of the keeper of the carriage and ran into the army and came and saluted his brethren. And he really respected them too. And as he talked with them, behold, there came up out of there came up the champion, the Philistine of Gath, Goliath by name. And out of the armies of the Philistines and spake according to the same words, and David heard them. And this is all new to him because David wasn't around for this whole battle. He was herding the sheep. And all of the all of the men of Israel, when they saw the man, fled from him and were sore afraid. Now <laughs> Goliath was a giant. Goliath was like six cubits tall, and I think it was eighteen inches roughly, so we're looking at about nine feet in height, and he was probably one of the smaller ones, according to things I've read. But he was a lot bigger than some of these guys. And they were, I mean, they were trembling. And the men of Israel said, Have you seen this man that has come up? Surely to defy Israel is he to come up, or is he come up? And it shall be that the men who killeth him, the man who killeth him, the king will enrich him with great riches and will give him his daughter and make his father's house free for Israel. And David spake to the men that stood by him, saying, What shall be done to the man that killeth this Philistine, and taketh away the reproach, or reproach from Israel? Question, For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? And you see David's faith is kind of coming out here. And the people answered him after this manner, saying, So shall it be done to the man that killeth him. He's he, I guess he will be enriched with great riches and have the king's daughter. Okay. And so David is kind of asking like, what, I mean, what are you guys doing sitting around here? Right. And Eliab, the, his eldest brother heard when he spake unto the men and Eliab's anger was kindled against David. And he said, why camest thou down hither? Why did you even come here? And with whom hast thou left those few sheep in the wilderness? He's trying to like, who'd you leave your sheep with? You know, kind of mocking David there. I know thy pride in the naughtiness of thine heart, for thou art come down that thou mightest see the battle. Like you just came on down to watch. And David said, what have I now done? Is there not a cause? And he turned from him toward one another and spake after the same manner and the people answered him again after the former manner and when the words were heard which David spake they rehearsed them before Saul and he sent him or he sent for him Saul did and David said to Saul let no man's heart fail because of him thy servant will go and fight with this Philistine I'm gonna I will stand up and I'll do it and Saul said to David, Thou art not able to go against the Philistine to fight with him, for thou art but a youth, and he a man of war from his youth. I mean, Goliath has always been a man of war. And David said unto Saul, Thy servant kept his father's sheep, and there came a lion and a bear and took a lamb out of the flock. And I went out after him and smote him and delivered it out of his mouth. And when he arose against me, I caught him by his beard and smote him and slew him. The servant slew both the lion and the bear. 
And this uncircumcised Philistine shall be as one of them, seeing he hath defied the armies of the living God. David said, Moreover, the Lord that delivered me out of the paw of the lion and out of the paw of the bear, he will deliver me out of the hand of the Philistine. I mean, this is quite, quite a bit of faith David has here in the Lord. And he's demonstrating, he's not even af- not afraid. And his brothers are all shaken in their boots. And Saul said unto David, Go, and the Lord be with you. And Saul armed David with his armor, the king's armor. And he put a helmet of a brass upon his head. Also, he armed him with a coat of mail, like chain mail, to protect him. And David girded up his sword upon his armor, and he essayed to go, for he had not proved it. And said, and David said unto Saul, I cannot go with these, for I have not proved them. And David put them off of him. Uh, so he took off everything that Saul had put on him. Now, chances are it was probably quite heavy, and David was not used to that type of thing, it it possibly could have just inhibited from fighting, inhibited him, his ability to fight. And he took his staff in his hand and chose him five smooth stones out of the brook. Now here, an interesting thing, the the number five um, represents grace. There are, you can document this, the, the times that the number five is used in scripture It pertains to something related to grace. Anyway, he took five smooth stones out of the brook and put them in a shepherd's bag, which he had even in a scrip. And his sling was in his hand. And when he drew near to the Philistine, and the Philistine came on, or and he drew near to the Philistine, okay? And the Philistine came on and drew near unto David, and the man that bare the shield went before him. And when the Philistine looked about and saw David, he disdained him, for he was but a youth and ruddy and of a fair countenance. In other words, I mean, a fair countenance. He he didn't even have facial hair. You know, he was a boy. And the Philistine said unto David, Am I a dog that thou comest to me with staves? You know, you just came with your staff and so forth. And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. And the Philistine said to David, Come to me, and I will give thy flesh unto the fowls of the air and to the beasts of the field. Now here we're going we're gonna to see some serious faith. Then David said, or then said David to the Philistine, Thou comest to me with a sword and with a spear and with a shield. But I come to thee in the name of the Lord of hosts the God of the armies of Israel, whom thou hast defiled. This day will the Lord deliver thee into my hand, and I will smite thee and take thy, thine head from thee, and I will give the carcasses of the host of the Philistines this day unto the fowls of the air and to the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. I mean, that is real faith. He has got some serious will going on here. And all this assembly shall know that the Lord saveth not with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. And it came to pass when the Philistine arose and came and drew nigh to meet David, that David hasted and ran toward the army to meet the Philistine. I mean, did he go running the other way? No, he ran toward Goliath ran toward that army. And David put his hand in his bag and took thence a stone and slang it and smote the Philistine in his forehead that the stone sunk into his forehead. And he fell upon his face to the earth. I mean, he was that dude was out cold. So David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and with a stone and smote the Philistine and slew him, but there was no sword in the hand of David. Remember, he said he was going to take his head. Therefore David ran and stood upon the Philistine and took his sword and drew it out of the sheath thereof and slew him. 
and cut off his head therewith. And when the Philistines saw their champion was dead, they fled. And the men of Israel and of Judah arose and shouted and pursued the Philistines until thou came or until thou come to the valley and to the gates of Ekron. And the wounded of the Philistines fell down by the way to Sher- Shearim, even unto Gath and unto Ekron. And the children of Israel returned from chasing after the Philistine, Philistines, and they spoiled their tents. And David took the head of the Philistine and brought it to Jerusalem. But he put his armor in his tent. So he must have taken Goliath's armor, put it in his tent. A little reward there, a little spoil. Possibly, I don't know. And when Saul saw that David go forth against the Philistine, he said unto Abner, the captain of the host, Abner, whose son is this youth? And Abner said, As thy soul liveth, O king, I cannot tell. And the king said, Inquire thou, thou whose son the stripling is. And David returned from the slaughter of the Philistine. Abner took him and brought him before Saul with the head of the Philistine in his hand. And Saul said to him, Whose son art thou, thou young man? And David answered, I am the son of thy servant Jesse the Bethlehemite. All right, so there is a, I mean, that is a great example of how we got to kick dragon for God. I mean, what will did this kid have and all the faith in God? He knew it was going to be God that would take him down. No hesitation whatsoever. So I look at what's going on in the world these days, and I see I see people, my brethren, that face crises and just they, and you hear it in their voice where they complain, saying, that this, you know, I am being afflicted this way or that way. Especially lately in, in the, I guess, the world of social media. Our brethren are being uh, censored. You know? Come on now. It's not like you have Goliath bearing down on you with a sword to take your life. Not at this time. But they're being censored. They're being silenced of of the truth. They're being demonetized by social media, social media giants, by the way. (laughs) And they are being um, shadow banned. They're being shut down. And I'm telling you that this is going to continue until they completely put you out of service. My question is, where is your will? You have... You have the Philistines coming after you. The giants are with them. Are you going to give up ground? It's time to take a stand for the, for the will of God or the way of God and the word of God. You need to be smarter than the serpent in these days. And there is a way to do things. And sometimes we have to be maybe covert about how we go about it. So as not to give up our, our means of defending ourselves and of taking this adversary down. But this, you know, we can't let anyone... We, we're not doormats, people. And as much as you think we are in end times and that, well, there's no point in this because it's all God's plan and we're all going into captivity, it, that may be so. But we don't throw in the towel. It's time to take a stand against the giants of this world. And tell them, show them who the Lord of hosts is and what he can do. It's pretty much all I got to say. 
Let's talk to the Father. Heavenly Father, I want to thank you for the study. Thank you so much for these examples here that we can have today. The example of Gideon and David. Father, I ask that you bless all those that are here today. Inspire them to fight for you, to fight for your cause, to protect all the means. I mean, these are their ministries that are being shut down by the enemy. Father, bless them with the will to stand and fight. We'll be sure and give you the praise for it in the name of Yeshua Messiah, Jesus Christ, thy Son and our Savior. Amen. All right, gang, that's pretty much it. The will of man, is it dead or is it alive? Well, we'll see. Anyway, thanks for thanks for tuning in. And um, I guess we'll see you next time. Talk to you later. God bless.